Hello, this is uh, Friday, May the 1st, and this is lecture 12. This is part 2 of the 5th commandment, and of course the 5th commandment we know is uh, found in Exodus chapter number 20, and uh, it tells us that we are to honor our the, uh, thy father and thy mother, uh, that thy days may be long upon the earth, or upon the land which, I, which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Very simple command uh, they're found in that, but difficult to keep. As we saw yesterday, all of the things that we reviewed concerning that particular command. Um, we left off with how we ought to be trying to seek advice from our parents in our endeavors in life. And we do not honor our mother and our father because they are honorable. We honor them because of the position that God has put them in. Now, God is always honorable, so as the Father in heaven, He is example for all fathers on the earth. And if you're a father, you need to be an honorable man to the best of your ability, serving the Lord all the days of your life. So not only should we submit to the authority that's over us, but we should also seek advice from our parents in our life's pursuits, whether it be marriage or job or whatever it may be, and... Um, also, we should seek to be a blessing and a comfort to our parents. Uh, in Proverbs chapter 31, and verse 28, it says, Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. So, keep, keep in your mind the idea that honoring is not just obeying, and you can obey and not honor. And uh, we're to seek then to do more than just an obedience. Because to say, okay, I'll do it, is really not a lot of honor. So uh, to seek to be a blessing would cause your children to rise up and bless you. Uh, so if you're not doing the things that would cause children to rise up and try to bless you, and to proclaim you as blessed uh, would probably mean we're failing in some aspects. We want to be faithful. In Jeremiah chapter number 35, in verse number 6, we read this. But they said, We will drink no wine, for Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, commanded us, saying, You shall drink no wine, neither ye nor your sons forever. It goes on to say, Thus we have obeyed the voice of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, in all that he hath charged us to drink no wine all our days, we, our wives, our sons, nor our daughters. So they vowed a vow, a vow that there's no biblical command that they should have had to have done this, but their father asked them to vow a vow over a particular matter, and that was that they wouldn't drink wine. Now, whatever his purpose was, whatever his reasons were for that, they honored it. And they said, that's fine. If that's what Dad asked us to do, and we agreed to do it. We vowed that we would do it. They stuck to that vow. And, and so they were honoring him. Even in something that isn't expressly forbidden in Scripture, it was a vow that they asked, that Dad asked them to do, and they kept it. In Matthew chapter 15, in verse number 4, we read, for God commanded, saying, <clears throat> Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. And honor not his father or mother, uh, he shall be free. Thus ye have made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. What had these Pharisees done. <clears throat> well, in the day in the days of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Pharisees had taken the commandments of God and they had dissected them to the point to make them manageable. They figured out ways to manage the commands of God to make them easier in their minds to obey. They looked at the commands of God as grievous. John tells us his commands are not grievous. But what they did is they would say this. That, um, they would take their money that they should have given to care for their parents in their old age or to aid them in some way, maybe to buy medication or to pay rent or buy to buy groceries. 
And so they took this money and they gave it to the temple. And by giving it to the temple, they said, if my parents need something, they can go to the temple and ask. This is what the scripture says. Um, he said, the scripture says, honor your father and your mother, and if you curse him, you should die the death. They, But ye say, whosoever shall say to his father and mother, it is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. He says, so God says, honor your father and mother, curse them and you die. But you say that if my mother and father come to me for help, I say, oh, the money I was going to help you with is a gift to the temple. I've already given it. I've given it away. So I don't have it anymore. So if you need anything by, from me, you need to go to, the, go to the temple and ask for it. Why should you try to profit from me? I'm just your son. And so they felt like because they had done a religious duty toward their, their, the temple to put it into, say, a widow's fund, that well, now their church is responsible for them. But there's no way, there's not a single thing in the Bible that indicates in any way that we can disregard duty to parents, or even family for that matter, and consider it a spiritual matter that we would disregard their needs over the needs of someone else. In fact, a man that will not provide for his own family, Paul declares him worse than an infidel. And we know what an infidel is. An infidel is someone who has no faith. So a faithless man, he says he's worse than a faithless man if he will not provide for his own family. So <clears throat> these Pharisees and Sadducees were trying to justify not caring for their parents by saying, I've already given the money to the temple to the widow's fund, so I don't need to take care of my mom and dad. And he said, so this tradition that you have gotten by giving your money to the temple and putting it in a widow's fund, this tradition that you have has made the commandment of God none effect. He said, in other words, you're saying the commandment of God doesn't apply to me because I've done this. Well, the commandment of God cannot be done away with that simply. So we're to comfort our parents in their old age. We're to be a blessing our lifestyle should be a blessing to our parents. You should consider how you're living your life. I've heard people say this. They've said, you know, well, I've got my life to live. My parents live theirs. But I've also heard parents say, well, I don't care about my kids. I'm just going to spend all their inheritance. I'm going to do whatever I want to do and, and not be concerned. And then they don't understand why their children have no regard for them. I've seen grandparents have pictures or have a tag on their car about, ask me about my, my, my grand pets or my grand dogs because they love their grand dogs and they want people to ask them about those. But when it comes to their grandchildren, well, they're a nuisance. So I can see it on both sides how families are disregarding the natural order of things that God has established. God has not incidentally called himself Father. He has not incidentally called his children his children. He had not incidentally called Jesus the Son. But those are pic pictures of what we are supposed to be aspiring to. Um, the Bible says that we're blessed if we keep his commandments, and we want to be faithful in that. So here are four duties that are required. The duties of the children to their parents. Children are to love and to reverence them. They're to be fearful of offending them because of the respect that they bear for them. Remember yesterday we read Hebrews 12 and verse number 9, which states, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. So what that means is when they corrected us, we obeyed them and did what they told us to do. I hope that is the pattern of your children. I hope if you're a child and you're listening to this and you're and if your parent corrects you, you reverence them. You give them respect by obeying them with a joyful and a cheerful heart, not stomping your foot, crossing your arms, and stomping out of the room. Now, I'm going to tell you, if I had ever done that as a child in my household, I don't know what the repercussions would have been. I learned very early on, my father taught me that when he or my mother gave me a command I was to honorably and politely 
obey that command. I was not allowed to grumble. In fact, I, I wasn't allowed to say why. I remember saying to my father one time, why? And he said, why sounds too close to the word whine. I don't want you whining about something I tell you to do, so don't say why anymore. Say yes, sir, and learn by it. Like I told you, the Proverbs teaches us that we, we learn obedience by, or we, we, we learn the why uh, to something by obeying the command. Um, so, first of all, is there, there's duties of children to their parents. There are duties to rulers and magistrates that are the natural stepping stone of being obedient to parents. We're being taught that. We're, we're to obey those that God has set over us in authority. These are, in effect, God's deputies. We are invested with authority from Him. Uh, Proverbs 8.15 says, By me, kings reign, and princes decree justice. We're talking about wisdom here, Lord Jesus Christ. By Him, kings reign. That's, that's where they get their power. That's where they get their authority. Princes decree justice. In uh, Romans 13, 6, For this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. They do not bear the sword in vain. They bear the sword with authority that is given to them from God. Now, they may be corrupt magistrates. God did raise up a nation known as Assyria and call them his rod. Why did he call Assyria that? He gave them power and authority so that they might come spank Israel. And they did it. So our authorities might not always be the kindest folks in town. Sometimes they may have an authoritarian hand, a heavy hand in some type of dealing. So we have to be very careful and uh, realize that if our, if our Christian duties are not being restricted by these people, uh, we need to go ahead and be faithful. Right now, uh, well, we, we've just had a reduction in our rules, but there's been the COVID-19 virus, and there's many people that are upset that the churches have been closed. But by the same token, they're not trying to restrict our Christian ability to minister. They're not, that's, that's not the intention of these orders, but it is rather for public safety. And so we honor that. And we, and we try to respect that, understanding that we are doing good to our fellow man in this aspect. And um, there's been many times throughout history that nations have not been able to meet for worship, either through war or plague or something of this nature. And in our case, this virus that came along, whatever your opinion on the virus is, um, this is what we've been asked to do, and we're trying to be as faithful as we possibly can. I believe the church is going to come out on the other side much better for this because all things do, in fact, work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Either it will happen or God's lied to us. So I believe we're, we're, we're in good shape. Um, so the four duties are the duties of children to parents, the duties of, to rulers and magistrates, and the duty of servants to masters. This is also seen in this. Masters are to be obeyed. Our, our bosses, the ones that we have... Uh, hired on and and part of the way we learn that is by being first of all obedient at a young age to our parents our parents say hey sweep the floor and we sweep the floor without grumbling our boss then says hey sweep the floor yeah that's not what you hired me to do okay wait a minute i hired you to give me eight hours of work yes your job description contains all the things that you do plus whatever may be required of you in addition to that that's usually how a job description reads. It's this and other duties as assigned. So if I assign you to sweep the floor, but I hired you to punch a computer key keyboard, well, you know what? Right now I need you to sweep the floor. And uh, so, so be careful about having a cavalier attitude toward any authority that's over you. If, in Colossians chapter 3, Paul writing to the church at Colossae, in chapter 3 and verse number 22, he says this, Servants, Obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service. And you know what eye service is? He said, not with eye service as men pleasers. In other words, if I'm told to do something, I don't perform to the best of my ability 
only when I'm being watched. I'm not supposed to do that. If somebody's standing over my shoulder and I'm doing a real good job and they walk away, that's not a signal for me to slack off now. So eye service means I'm serving you as long as I know your eye is on me. Or if I know you're going to know what I've been doing, then I'm going to do a good job. But if I'm left to myself in a room to work, I'm going to slack off, do what I want to. Paul says, no, 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 no. That is a men pleaser. You're only working trying to please, you know, yourself. And that is not what we want to be involved in. I have read read testimonies of people who um, have many times been involved in uh, occupations where they've had several people hired to do a job. And the people will start off in the job with this attitude of, I'm going to, I'm going to make the company better. I'm going to provide for this company. Whatever you need from me, boss, I'll be here. I'll work weekends. You just tell me what you want. And as quick as they get the job and join the union, or as quick as they get the job and get settled in and get their time in past their probationary period, they become almost impossible to deal with. So, be extremely careful about having that kind of attitude. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but here's how. In singleness of heart, fearing God. Now, if you and I, to have, the, to have a single eye means to have this focus that I'm looking at one thing. Um, when a man marries a woman, he needs to be singular of eye, meaning his eyes are only for her. He, he's, he's going to stay faithful to her all the days of his life. He keeps his eye on his wife. She's the one. I've got, I've got my eye on you, is what they're basically saying in that aspect. So he says, this is how you serve God. Singleness of heart, fearing God. So the singular goal in my heart is to make sure that I'm faithful to God. I have a singular heart for him. So this is how I'm going to serve him. Well, when we serve those that are over us in authority, we're to do it as we do unto the Lord. We have a singleness of heart. Our heart is set on one thing, is pleasing our Heavenly Father. And part of pleasing our Heavenly Father is not being a men pleaser and not serving with eye service. He goes on to say, verse 23, Colossians 3, 23, And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. This is probably the biggest challenge that many parents have with younger children. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. We don't do our duty heartily. If we're told to take the trash out, we mumble, we murmur, we drop our shoulders, we drag the trash across the floor. If we're told to sweep, we don't get in the corners. If we're told to clean, we don't clean carefully. Uh, We don't put everything back where it belongs. We don't fold our clothes. We don't make our bed. We don't do all these things because the truth of the matter is, is we're not doing it heartily. We're doing it with an attitude of just getting through it. That is not how we're to function. It's not how we should ever be in obedience. Could you imagine if I came to preach one Sunday morning and I stepped into the pulpit and I said, I've tried to study, but I watched ball games all week long and I slept in and I didn't get a chance to pray much because of that. And I went fishing most of the week and and uh, did and hunting season open. I mean, I've been out every morning trying to get me a turkey or or whatever my argument was. I haven't got much for y'all today, but uh, you know what? Let's just sing a few songs and pray. And how long would you let me get away with that as your pastor before you would finally say, Pastor, you need to be called to some accountability because you're not feeding the flock. You just are not doing what you promised you would do for us as a man of God and that is to be faithful to preach the untarnished the unaltered word of God I'd be like well you're right so whatever I do I need to do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men I need to do my duties like I'm doing it for God Uh, one of the reasons that Pastor Josh and myself study is because we want to be able to know what we're talking about but it's also so that we can do our job 
with heart. We want to do it with a fervor. We want to do it with assurance. We want to do it with uh, capable minds and, and to be able to perform our task in a way that it doesn't look like we've been slacking off. Because well, that's, that's not what we want to do. We don't want to slack off. We want to be faithful. And that's uh, one of the reasons that during this, I, I was telling uh, Brother Ronnie, our deacon, the other day, I, I said to him, I said, you know, my back got injured just right before this virus thing started. And I said, you can't imagine how many times I've been sitting here during this virus thinking all the stuff I could be doing outside. Man, I need to fix this fence. I need to fix this. I've got a, I've got a chicken coop that needs some work done on it. I've got a fence that needs to be torn down, another one needs to be put up. I've got things that need to be adjusted and cared for around the property, and I just, I, I, I'm so disappointed. Oh, my, really. But you know what the Lord has done? During this time that I couldn't do other things, I've been able to pick up books and read them. I've been able to write devotions. I've been able to work on these lectures that you're getting right here. I've been able to study deeper for my Wednesday evening services and my I'm doing the Sunday school lesson right now while Pastor Josh is preaching the morning service. And all of this has been going on for the that, that I wouldn't have probably focused on had I not had a back injury. So I have been able to devote myself much more heartily to these things. So I'm counting it a great blessing that I had an injury. That in the midst of my sufferings or my distress... I was able to call unto the Lord, and, and He made me search my heart a lot closer. So, I'm counting it a blessing. Thank you for your prayers that I would get better, but um, the Lord wasn't ready for me to get better yet. Verse 24 says, Knowing that, the, that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. Just remember, fathers set aside inheritances for their children if they have any means whatsoever. It may be property, it may be cash, something of that nature. We don't really know what it will be, but they set aside an inheritance. The Heavenly Father has an inheritance waiting on His children. And He says, know this, whatever you do, do heartily as unto the Lord, knowing this, that, that the, of the Lord you should receive the reward of inheritance. You're not going to receive an eternal inheritance from men. But we're to work heartily as unto the Lord when we work for men. And the Lord sees that and reckons it has done unto him. Why? Because he says this, For ye serve the Lord Christ. Wait a minute, but I, I, I'm hired on with company XYZ. Aren't I serving them? Well, yes, you are. You're serving them right at this moment in time. But ultimately, how you serve them is that you are serving Christ. Listen to this verse closely again. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. This is who you serve. You're serving Christ. Well, the fourth duty, I said the duties were the duties of children to their parents, the duty of ruler to, toward rulers and magistrates, the duties of servants toward masters, but also seen in this is the duties of pastors and congregation. Pastors and congregation. God has set up a system of authority to maintain order in his church as well. The pastor is the one that literally stands in the place of God to instruct, to rebuke, to reprove, to edify, to comfort, and many other duties, but I'm, I'm here as an under-shepherd. Jesus Christ is the great shepherd, and he's given to the church under-shepherds, those that would be a light to the congregation and would, would teach, instruct, and warn to do all of these things. In fact, it's part of our duty to exhort and to rebuke and to correct and to teach the word. So that with that comes a, a form of authority in it. Not a dictator, because I am ultimately I serve at at, at the at the at the desire of the people who can remove me from my office. Um, but ultimately I serve the Lord, but I serve it at the will of the people that they desire me to be there to bring the word to them. Here's a few verses uh, that speak to this aspect. In 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 3, he says, But he that prophesieth 
keep talking about preaching, speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. So I keep that in mind. I'm to be exhorting. I'm to be edifying. To edify means to build a person up. An edifice is like a, a, a mound of dirt or a wall. Um, I'm edifying, building up. I'm exhorting. That's encouraging someone to go forward and do that which is right. And comforting. I'm comforting. Uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 2 through 4, says this, Preach the word. As he's talking to Timothy, he tells him, Preach the word. So I take the word of God and I preach it. That's part of my duty. Uh, be instant in season, and uh, instant in season, out of season, uh, and be ready at any moment, whatever the season be. Reprove, uh, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So, challenge for a pastor is while I'm reproving and I'm rebuking, I'm so, I'm supposed to be doing it with all long suffering. In other words, even though the person might not be obeying me immediately. The temptation for me as a human being is to say, I've told you once, I've told you twice, I ain't telling you again. That's kind of how we deal with our children on certain things. Look, I've told you to clean, pick up your room. You didn't pick up your room. I've told you again. I gave you a second chance. And you feel that way toward the people of the congregation many times when you say, listen, husband, be kind to your wife. And the next thing I hear, the wife says, he's just not being kind to me. He's being rude. He yells at me. He's, he's not caring for me. Look, how many times am I going to tell you, son? Be kind to your wife. That's the, that's, that's the thought in the fleshly mind of a pastor. And a pastor has to remember, wait a minute, I'm commanded by Scripture. Yes, I am to reprove and I am to rebuke this person. I'm to exhort them. But I've got to do it with all long suffering. And here's the other key with doctrine. I've got to back up what I tell somebody in counseling with biblical doctrine. I can't give counsel off of, well, let me tell you what worked for me. Now, something may have indeed worked for me, but it better have been based on sound doctrine. If it wasn't, then I don't need to be proclaiming it. Many errors and heresies within a church have started because a spiritual leader has made a determination to preach opinion rather than doctrine. So I've got to stick close to the doctrine. Uh, verse 3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. Well, the people will have itching ears. They want to hear something new. And so they bring to themselves teachers that are going to give them these new things. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. We've seen many people disobey the plain commands of Scripture only to end up in error. Very sad. Neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. Hmm, this is, this is uh, 1 Peter 5.3. So instead, in, instead of being an example to the flock that is in front of you, you try to lord over God's heritage like a dictator. You know, oh, I'm the pastor. This is what I say. I don't care. Well, pastor, how come you don't do that? It don't matter what I do. You do what I say. Don't do as I do. Mm. Not a lot of wisdom in that. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28, this is, this is a very pleasant verse. Um... It's a great encouragement to me. Listen to this, Acts 20, 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves. Now Paul's talking to the elders at Ephesus. They're, they're, he's about to, about to head out and he tells them this. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. Wow. I want you to watch out for yourselves. Take heed to yourselves. But to all the flock as well. Because God has made you an overseer, a presbyter. He has put you in charge of this flock. What am I supposed to do? Listen. To feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Do you imagine if somebody had a multi-million dollar diamond, and they brought the diamond to you, and they placed it in your hand, and they said, Watch this diamond that I have paid millions of dollars for. Hold on to it and take care of it till I return. Wow, we would be scared to death, wouldn't we? What if I lost this diamond? What if I dropped this diamond? What if it's stolen? We would be so concerned about it. We watched an animal for someone one time that loved their animal dearly, and they were like, please take care of our animal while we're gone. And we're like, oh, don't worry, we will. 
Every time something happened that I thought that animal was injured or hurt or was going to disappear or something, I would have a panic attack. I'd be like, oh no, oh no. How much more should ministers of the gospel concern themselves with the church that the Holy Ghost has made us overseers? How important should it be that a preacher would want to feed his flock, which God has purchased with his own blood? Very important. We'll pick up on Monday with part three of commandment number five here. And we'll talk about um, how, the, how the congregation is to obey the pastor and how the pastor is not to take a hard hand with them in that aspect.